All right, Second Timothy for beginners. Lesson number six, Paul's final exhortation and testimony and benedictions, blessings if you wish, Second Timothy 4, 1 to 22. So as the, uh, the title of this lesson suggests, Paul finishes his letter with various messages aimed at different people, different people, different groups. There may not be time for another letter as far as Paul is concerned. So he wants his final word of encouragement to prophet Timothy for a long time to come. This is his uh, you know, last shot at giving this young guy advice and encouragement in his uh, ministry. So in chapter four, verse one, he says, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead and by his appearing and his kingdom. So Paul is uh, coming to the end of his letter, as I say, and uh, he wants to challenge Timothy to his task. And he, um, he does so by reminding him of three things concerning Jesus, because it's about Jesus, isn't it? I mean, the preaching is about Jesus, the story is about Jesus, the promises are through Jesus, and so on and so forth. So three things about Jesus. The first thing he says, Jesus is going to judge. Remember that. Jesus will be the one judging all men and women and also judging the work of all elders and deacons and preachers. And so this thought should help Timothy to stand firm when criticized or attacked by those in or out of the church. They may be criticizing you, but they're not the ones who are going to judge you. There's a difference. Keep that in mind. We, we need to keep that in mind even today. Some people may criticize us for what we do as Christians, but they're not the ones who are going to judge us in the end. And so Paul is making sure that Timothy stays focused on this idea. Jesus will be the judge. Knowing that Jesus will examine your work as well as your conduct helps you when you're tempted to compromise your teachings or uh, gain approval or promote your career. Speaking now to the preacher. Just remember who's going to be doing the judging. Never mind who's doing the criticizing. Never mind who's doing the, the praise. You know, some people will compromise, unfortunately, will compromise what's true, what's right, what's good, in order to continue to receive praise and approval from, from people. So Paul tells them, just remember, Jesus is the one who's going to judge you. Number two, Jesus will return. He writes, I charge you by His appearing. Uh, William Barclay, a writer, commentator, offers an interesting insight to this phrase, I charge you by His appearing. The Greek word for appearing, epiphania, was used in two different ways at that time. The first way was when a God would manifest itself in some way. They used this Greek word, epiphania. Or it was used in connection with the Roman emperor. His ascension to the throne, for example, was referred to as his epiphania. Or, as Paul is using it here, it was used to describe the visit of the emperor to a city or to a region in the Roman Empire. And so places that were anticipating the epiphania of the emperor would prepare by sprucing up the town and organizing an honor guard, and we do that today. The governor is going to go come visit the school for some event. Wow, I mean, the floors get waxed and everything's in order and the kids are told, make sure you put on your nice clothes and you know, all the teachers are ready for what? For, well, the appearing of the governor. Well, they had a Greek word for that, epiphania. So Paul is telling Timothy to prepare for an epiphania. However, not one from an earthly king or leader, but from Jesus himself, the divine Son of God and Lord of creation. So if you're getting the town spruced up for the epiphania of the governor or the, or the, the king, that's, you know, that's fine. Imagine what you need to be doing for the appearing of the Son of God. That's the point he's making to, to Timothy. 
Timothy should do his work in such a way that he is ready for the epiphania of Jesus or the appearing of Jesus at any time. So Paul reminds Timothy, Jesus will be doing the judging, Jesus will return, and one third thing, Jesus will rule. Paul urges Timothy to action by reminding him that at some point all the kingdoms and the principalities and the rulers and the powers will be under Jesus' rule. He is and will be the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And so Timothy must work in such a way that, that you will rank high, he will rank high in the kingdom that will have dominion over all the other kingdoms when Jesus, who is the Lord of all, returns to judge all men and their works. Chapter four, verse two, Paul says, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. So in this verse, Paul provides a very compact summary of Timothy's responsibilities as a preacher or an evangelist or a minister, any term you want to you know, assign to Timothy, they all fit. His basic task is to preach God's word in any way, in any place, to as many people as he can. It's the same job today. The method, wow, the method, you know, in those days in the market square, in different places, sometimes in synagogues, today, of course, from the pulpit, TV, books, online, whatever, all based on the individual's skills and training and opportunity, but the job is always the same, to preach the gospel. The job never changes. Now the manner, he talks to Timothy, the manner in which he does his work, well, in a word, urgent. Be urgent about it, whether it's a large or small audience, an enthusiastic or indifferent audience, whether it's a convenient time or an awkward moment, the preacher should preach in such a way that the hearer understands not only the message, but that he also understands how important it is to respond to the message. It's urgent. I mean, it's, it's a matter of eternal life or eternal death. So of course it's urgent, be urgent in what you're doing. And he also reminds him of his objectives as a minister. What are the objectives? Well, to reprove. Some versions of the Bible use the word convict. Maybe that's your version. The preacher's task is to use God's word to point out what is wrong, what is sinful, what is worldly in a person's life so that they can repent and of course be baptized into Christ. They also do the same for believers in order to help them recognize and deal with sin in their lives. Now of course, People don't always enjoy this type of preaching. But if the preacher doesn't reprove of sin, who will? You're not going to get it from your bank teller, you know, or you're not going to go to Walmart or uh, you know, wherever you go, have your tires changed. And the person says, oh, and by the way, how's, how, uh, how are you handling your uh, alcoholism? You know, no, they're not going to mention anything. Got that temper of yours under control yet? You know? The guy at Walmart tells you as he's bagging your stuff. Oh no, they don't bag your stuff anymore. You got to bag your stuff. You know what I'm saying. No, no one else is going to talk to you about spiritual matters. And if the preacher doesn't do it, well then you're not, you're not receiving any type of reproof. He says part of the job also to rebuke. A more modern term would be to call out call out someone for something that is improper. John the Baptist rebuked Herod for his unlawful marriage to his brother's wife. It wasn't just, you know, he, he got divorced and he married this woman. I mean, he, he went to Rome, he stole his brother's wife while he was in Rome. He took off with her and he came back and set her up as the queen and threw his wife out. Yeah, <laughs> and she was his niece by marriage, so. <laughs> Yeah, it, it didn't work in a lot of ways. But John the Baptist called him out on that. Rebuke is like reproof, but it's more personal. It's more pointed. You know, some say, what's the difference between reproof and rebuke? Well, you know, 
when the preacher's reproving, he's talking about sin. When he's rebuking, he's talking about your sin. There's the you know, fine difference there, if you wish. So preachers often receive their greatest criticism or lose their jobs because they've rebuked a prominent member, perhaps an elder or family member of a church leader because of bad behavior or divisive speech. Uh, reprove, rebuke, exhort means to encourage, to comfort, to rally a member or the entire congregation. It can't always be about rebuking and reproving. When that's the diet, week after week after week, people get tired of it and I don't blame them. There's got to be a mixture there. Exhortation is also important. God's word contains God's promises and witness of His love and mercy and His generosity and we also need to be reminded of that. The preacher needs to constantly remind the congregation of these things because we live in a world filled with darkness and death and the ruler of this world is always seeking to destroy our faith and our hope of resurrection. A good approach is to go lightly with the reproof and the rebuke. People know, normally people know what their problems are, what their sins are. They don't need to be beaten over the head with it. I've found in my experience that exhortation is important, very important, because people tend to beat themselves up a lot. <laughs> so you don't have to beat them up from the pulpit as well. But folks need encouragement. Christians, most of them that I've met, they want to do the right thing. They, they want to love God, demonstrate their faith. But of course, life gets in the way, right? So Paul has has summarized what Timothy is to do, preach the word, why he should take care in carrying out his ministry. Well, Jesus uh, will judge and rule. He reminds him of the purpose of his preaching, to reprove and rebuke and exhort, and the tone of his message should be urgent. And finally, the attitude he must maintain throughout, and that is patience, patiently teaching without exasperation or anger. Uh, people who raise children, or I should say young people who are in the process of raising small children, <coughs> uh, usually say, how many times do I have to say it? <laughs> and you know, I've told our uh, children that are raising very young children, you're going to have to say no a lot. Right? You're going to have to repeat no, 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 I mean eventually. And then kids, they figure out, wait a minute, I know that by the tenth no, maybe the, that no will turn into a yes. And the biggest job of raising you know, toddlers is to convince them that no actually means no. And that takes a long time sometimes, years. Yeah. Chapter four, verse three and four, he goes on to say, for the time will come when they, meaning in the world, they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires and will turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside to myths. Uh, I said the world, but the time will come when they, they meaning the people in the church actually. So Timothy needs to cultivate this patient teaching attitude because things are going to get worse before they get better. He even describes the scenario of unfaithfulness that will take place in many churches. People will grow weary of hearing sound or healthy doctrine that teaches them to deny the world and aspire to things that are above. You repeat that and repeat that and repeat that and people many times forget it or they discard it because they may already be influenced and in increasing their consumption of earthly things, many of which might be sinful or spiritually unwholesome. Their hearing or their conscience begins to enjoy less the teaching from God's word. People who don't like to hear God's word usually are consuming something else. And the worldly thing that they're consuming doesn't like to coexist with this here. 
So instead of responding positively to the reproof or the rebuke, instead of an amen to the preacher's exhortation to move forward spiritually to greater maturity, they find somebody else who will not slow down their spiritual decline with his preaching. Eventually, Paul says, their rejection of some of God's word that deals specifically with their sins is replaced with a total rejection of God Himself by practicing a religion not based on God's word, but one based on myths, man's word. Verse four and five, but you, he says, but you be sober in all things. Endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Again, Paul turns his attention to Timothy and his ministry, three final exhortations. Be sober, means be serious, not given to emotional reactions to everything. Today we'd say, you know, go easy on the drama. A sober-minded person is not led by his feelings. He has feelings, but he doesn't allow the feelings to dictate his thoughts and actions. Timothy needs to be clear-eyed. He needs to make sound judgments and not be carried away by his emotions if he is to succeed in his ministry going forward. Be sober, he says. Endure hardship. Paul has already warned him of the trouble to come, so he reminds him that when it does come, he needs to weather the storm. It's not if trouble comes, it's when it comes. It's going to come. And we know that. I mean, I'm looking in this class, pretty mature group here. Yeah, it's not if trouble comes. I mean, trouble always comes in, in some form or another, right? Illness or, I don't know, so something breaks down or somebody you know, totals our car. Or, uh, Trouble always comes. Sometimes in ministry, you can't change a bad situation, but you can always persevere. You can always do that. Troubles might lead Timothy to consider quitting or running away, so Paul encourages him to choose endurance over surrender when hardship comes. You know, don't quit, keep going. Keep going, he says. And then thirdly, he says, do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. These thoughts are connected to the precious idea of enduring hardship. Now enduring doesn't mean doing nothing. Doing nothing is the same as giving up. Enduring in Paul's estimation means that despite the difficulties, whatever those may be, Timothy is to continue doing his job as an evangelist, proclaiming the gospel to the lost and fulfilling his ministry to the church. Well, what's his ministry to the church? Well, to reprove and rebuke and encourage, so on and so forth. God will judge his work as it has been performed in both ideal and difficult situations. I mean, you know, if the preacher quits when things go bad, that's why he's saying to him, you, you not only have a responsibility to accurately teach the things of God, but you yourself have to maintain your own faith, your own hope, your own firm bedrock belief that this is God's word and these things will come to be. Jesus will return. Don't doubt it. So Paul now returns the focus on himself and as an example to Timothy, he reviews his own ministry, which has for the most part been successfully carried out in the most difficult of circumstances. And he's now finishing with his execution at the hands of the Roman government. So we go into you know, chapter four, six to eight, uh, this section, Paul's final testimony. Now we need to remember that this letter will not only be read by Timothy, but as was the custom in the early church, copies of it would be circulated to other churches for their instruction and their edification as well. Paul therefore makes his final testimony before Timothy and the church concerning his life in the present, his life in the past, 
and of course what will happen in the future. So he begins with the present, verse six. He says, for I am already being poured out as a drink offering and the time for my departure has come. So using the language of the Jewish sacrificial system, also a language you know, that pagans also used in animal sacrifices in their rituals. There were some similarities. Paul describes his death as a sacrifice to God. He refers to it as a drink offering. The drink offering was the last stage of the sacrificial ritual where the priest would pour wine, uh, not on the altar, but to the side of the altar. And this represented the offering of a person's work to the Lord. The animal was on the altar. The drink offering was poured to the side. So in this sense, Paul is telling Timothy that his own life and ministry will be offered to the Lord by way of his martyrdom, which he believed was uh, imminent. So that's, that's what's happening now. Paul is describing what's happening now. Then he talks about the past, his past ministry, verse seven. He says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. Here he testifies concerning the ministry he had been given him by Jesus himself. You know, the good fight of the contest is the Christian life itself and the effort to live it faithfully right to the end. Paul, like all other Christians, has successfully lived a faithful Christian life. What's your goal in life? To be rich, to be this? No, my goal is to finish life faithfully. Rich or poor is, has nothing to do with it. I mean, I'd much rather be well off and comfortable and you know, but that's neither here nor there. My goal is to faithfully finish my life. And of course, finish the course set for him by God as an apostle to the Gentiles and done it so well that he is now about to give his life in service to his calling. And so Paul views his martyrdom as a, a complete success, a complete success. And then thirdly, he's also kept the faith in that he has maintained and proclaimed the gospel as it was given to him without change until the end. Then he talks about the future, verse eight. He says, in the future there's laid up for me the crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. So there's the future. Paul reaches back to what he said to Timothy in encouraging him to stay faithful to his ministry. You know, the idea that Jesus will judge Jesus will judge this ministry when he returns or appears, you know, his epiphania. So in the same way, Paul, who has been faithful in his life and ministry, will receive a crown of righteousness at the end. This crown of righteousness is the true condition of being righteous before God. Not as a hope while he inhabited a sinful flesh, but as a reality once the spirit is released from the body through death. You know, we say I'm righteous in Christ because you know, uh, God considers me righteous. You know, when He looks at me, you know, we said this before, when He looks at me, He sees Jesus. The blood of Jesus covers all of my unrighteousness. What Paul is saying, I'm, I'm going towards that place and that time when I actually will be righteous. It's not going to be Jesus is covering my, no, I will be righteous before God. I will be in the perfected state. That's the crown of righteousness. While alive on the earth, I'm considered perfect. I'm considered righteous through faith. But when in heaven, I actually will be perfect and righteous before God, never to deal with sin again. My relationship with Him in heaven will not be based on my sin or the cross of Jesus. So this crown of righteousness is its own reward, but it also signals that the eternal life promised by and through Jesus is now an experienced reality. Paul adds that the past and present he refers to are uniquely his, but the future he describes belongs to everyone who fights the good fight and finishes faithfully and holds to God's word without change. The last section of this epistle, chapter four, nine to 22, 
blessings and benedictions. The instructions and the exhortations have been given. The final section contained the personal news and greetings and blessings, so let's just kind of go over these. He begins with kind of personal news. He says, make every effort to come to me soon, for Demas, having loved this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia, Titus to uh, Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Pick up Mark and bring, with, uh, bring him with you, for he is useful to me for service. But Tychicus I have sent to Ephesus. When you come, bring the cloak which I left at Troas with Carpus and the books, especially the parchments. Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm. The Lord will repay him according to his deeds. Be on guard against him yourself, for he vigorously opposed our teaching. So Paul earnestly hopes to see Timothy before he is executed, and he fills him in on you know, what's been taking place since they last you know, communicated. So let's just break it down by the names. Demas, once a faithful helper, spoke about him in Colossians 4 verse 14. Demas has abandoned Paul to return home to Thessalonica and this way Paul describes him has also abandoned the faith. A very sad thing. Crescens and Titus he has sent to other works since Paul is in prison. Luke only is remaining, the only remaining worker tending to Paul and uh, uh, serving as a link to the outside world from his prison cell. Mark, that's John Mark, who was on the first missionary journey and who eventually wrote one of the Gospels. He has been restored to service and after having left on the first missionary journey to return home, he is now back in service uh, with uh, Paul and the others. And Tychicus, or Tychicus, depending on how you want to say that, he is being sent to Ephesus to replace Timothy. Timothy's in Ephesus, he's sending Tychicus to Ephesus, Timothy going to Rome. So Paul you know, moved his people around from place to place to manage the work. He provides a, a personal request for Timothy to bring his personal belongings when he comes. His cloak for the approaching winter in a cold cell, there was no central heat. You know, it was just a cold, it was a dungeon, a, you know, underground cell. Uh, his books of scripture to use uh, at the trial, to argue his case concerning the Christian faith. The idea is, was the Christian faith uh, the cause of insurrection? Were the Christians responsible for the fire? Was he a rabble rouser, an insurrectionist, a rebel? From the scriptures, Paul was going to argue, look, these, these are our teachings, love one another, you know, forgive enemies, does that sound like People who are going to set the city on fire, are, are these teachings worthy of, of, of death? You know, he's going to make his argument to save his life, but also to present the reality and the true teachings of the faith. Alexander, um, some uh, artisan in Rome who was probably used as a witness for those who were prosecuting Paul in court, Paul calls on God's judgment of this person because of the damage that he's caused the faith and the teaching by attacking Paul, an, an apostle of the gospel. Uh, at one time, they could openly preach in Rome. Now, the religion is being outlawed. People are being careful. Uh, he warns Timothy to avoid this man so as not to get into trouble himself when he comes. Verse 16 to 18, he says, at my first defense, no one supported me, but all deserted me. May it not be counted against them. But the Lord stood with me and strengthened me so that through me the proclamation might be fully accomplished and that all the Gentiles might hear and I was rescued out of the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever, amen. So here Paul describes some of what has taken place, not just information on the coming and going of various people. Those being prosecuted at Caesar's court were allowed to have a lawyer to help organize their defense strategy, uh, to gather evidence, uh, to guide the individual through the Roman legal system. So they were allowed to have a lawyer. They could also call on character witnesses or prominent citizens to testify on their 
behalf, on the prisoner's behalf, and vouch for their character, much like we do today. Um, any person that Paul could have called upon, however, refused to come to his defense. That's the point he's making. Remember, uh, Christians in general were being blamed for the fire, that, for starting the fire that destroyed a good portion of the city of Rome. Historians tell us that Nero himself set the fire so that he could redesign and rebuild the portion of the city that was burned down. We learned that from the historian Tacitus uh, around 64 AD. Paul, as a prominent Christian leader, was arrested uh, as part of the effort to punish believers for this particular uh, event. So Paul, in describing how those who might have supported or defended him at trial, abandoned him instead, afraid that any association with him might compromise their reputation or their standing at the imperial court. Remember in, another, in the other letter saying, well, we have people in the Praetorian Guard, we have people in Caesar's household, you know, lots of people are coming to the faith, and so yeah, but none of those people <laughs> just went to court. <laughs> All of those people he talked about, none of them went to court to vouch for him. Okay. So Paul is not, you know, when he says uh, everybody about, he's not saying that every Christian helper, you know, like Timothy or Luke, abandon him, uh, since these, these men would not be qualified to handle legal matters and they had no standing at court. And if Luke decided to speak on behalf of Paul, he'd be arrested as well because he was a, you know, a Christian leader and worker. So he, Paul's not talking about those people. Paul mentions a first defense, suggesting that uh, he was spared the death penalty at the first hearing or at the first trial. Even though he was alone to present his defense to the court, the Lord provided strength and wisdom so that Paul could make one last proclamation of the gospel to the highest officials of the Roman Empire and the crowd of prominent citizens that would be assembled to watch this trial. You know, Jesus made the promise to provide what to say when the apostles would be brought before governors and kings. Well, that promise is fulfilled here, that what Paul is talking about promise made in Matthew 10, 19 and 20. So through the eyes of faith, Paul sees that the message preached to these people would eventually find its way to the entire Roman Empire and beyond. Even though it would cost him his life, he still managed to get the message out. Okay. So he finishes this section by noting that despite the sureness of his execution, the Lord will protect his soul so that whatever happens to his body, his eternal salvation is safe because Jesus himself will bring him into heaven after, uh, after his death. And then he closes out with a short doxology. A doxology is a burst of praise, sudden praise um, for, the, uh, for the Lord. Final greetings, 19 to 21. He says, greet Prissa and Aquila and the household of Onis, uh, On Onisiphorus, I had it before, Onesiphorus, that's it. Erastus, uh, Erastus remained at Corinth, but uh, Trophimus uh, left sick at Miletus. Make every effort to come before winter. Uh, Eubulus uh, greets you, also Pudens and uh, Linus and Claudia and all, uh, all the brethren. So Paul mentions other co-workers familiar to Timothy to whom he sends greetings. Uh, Prissa, that's Priscilla, you know, Priscilla and Aquila, you know, Priscilla, uh, with whom Paul had lived and worked uh, when he was in Corinth, Acts 18, 12. Onesiphorus, mentioned in uh, chapter one, verses 16 to 18, who was helpful to Paul while he was imprisoned. Uh, Erastus, another worker who along with Timothy was sent by Paul into Macedonia from their base work in Ephesus. Uh, Trophimus, a Gentile convert from Ephesus and worker with Paul. He was with Paul in Jerusalem. It's interesting if you remember this guy here. Uh, he was with Paul in Jerusalem when Paul was first arrested by the Jews. They accused Paul of bringing this man here, Tro uh, Trophimus, who was a Gentile, into the temple area and that's what started the, the, the riot that got Paul uh, arrested. So Paul is mentioning him one more time here, he's still in the picture. 
Uh, Paul repeats his request of Timothy to hurry his visit before winter. Uh, he knows the end is near and he sends greetings to Timothy from brothers and sisters who are in Rome. Then his final blessing, verse uh, 22, where we go. Uh, the Lord be with your spirit, grace uh, be with you. So his blessing and prayer is, is all encompassing. The Lord be with his spirit and the grace of the Lord be with him. These two include all that a Christian could ever want or need and the presence and favor of the Lord ever present in one's life. If you have that, you, you have pretty much everything. Uh, a little coda here, if you wish. Uh, in the fall of 64 AD, Paul was executed in Rome, roughly that time period. It, he was decapitated. Since as a Roman citizen, it was against the law to execute him by crucifixion. Only slaves, criminals, non-citizens were crucified. Citizens, uh, uh, met their death uh, in a different way. Four years later, on June 9th, 68 AD, Nero committed suicide when he learned that he had been tried in absentia and condemned to death as a public enemy, making him the first Roman, Empire, uh, Roman emperor rather, to take his own life. And so Paul and Nero, uh, who had been intertwined in history for a while there, uh, died not much, uh, not much time between uh, their deaths. Uh, we finished that book, a couple of lessons, and then uh, we'll, uh, we'll close out our uh, series. I think we can uh, draw a lot of lessons from the letter itself, but I leave you with two, two lessons, one doctrinal and one practical. The doctrinal lesson, the Bible is inspired, right? The Bible is inspired. 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. The Bible is inspired. Most problems in the church and in life arise or get worse because we don't make the Bible the God-inspired guide for our lives. You know, both uh, preachers and saints need to maintain and defend or teach this essential truth in order to keep themselves and the church faithful to Christ. I mean, we know this, but we forget it. We know it and we set it aside and you know, every generation, you know, we've said it before, you know, we're just one generation away from apostasy. We have to maintain this, this, the, you know, this truth ourselves and we have to teach it and, 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 and teach and explain to the next generation why this is so. So that's the doctrine, the Bible's inspired. And then the practical lesson, Jesus will never leave you. Jesus will never leave you. That's easy to memorize, right? Paul said it twice, 2 Timothy 4, 17, but the Lord stood with me, and then the Lord will rescue me from every evil deed. So no matter what the world says, or the voice in your head says, Jesus will never leave you or abandon you. You may want to leave him, but he will never want to leave you. Knowing this truth, this promise, is the basis for our courage and our faith, and it is the foundation upon which we can build a glorious Christian life here and receive an eternal life forever. The knowledge that the Lord will never leave us. He loves us to the extent that he gave his life for us. And so he's not ready to leave us once we've confessed his name. He wa <laughs> God wants us to go to heaven, believe it or not, more than we want to go to heaven. He wants it more than we do. And he works all things in such a way to make that happen in, in, in our lives. Okay, well thank you so much for your attention, your attendance to the class. We finished 2 Timothy, one more to go. Titus, Titus, I think, was it three, three, Titus has three lessons. So we're going to do Titus, and once we finish Titus, if the Lord is willing, we will have completed the entire New Testament. We'll have, we'll have studied every single book in the New Testament, and we have a series on every single book in the New Testament. So we'll really be able to offer that particular feature for our BibleTalk.tv uh, ministry. All right, thank you very much.